If Atlanta is lost to the Union, it will propel President Abraham Lincoln into a second term and the continuation of the war against the South. But if the Union falls, Confederate forces may be able to beat General Grant in his desperate bid to take Virginia and defeat the Confederacy. This is the story of the presidents, generals, and soldiers who lived through the battle for Atlanta and the summer of fire. It is 1864, and the country has been divided for four years. Brother fights brother over the rights of the states under the government. This is the American Civil War. The fighting is divided into two strategic arenas, the Eastern and Western Theater. The Eastern Theater comprised of Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C., is typically viewed as the more vital of the two, for it houses the capitals of both sides. It is a 250-mile stretch that starts from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and ends at Petersburg, Virginia, just below Richmond. Over 200,000 men are to die in this smaller theater. But it is in the Western Theater where many of the more decisive and critical battles take place. The Western Theater spans the area east of the Mississippi River and west of the Appalachian Mountains. It is vital to the Confederacy as it contains major rivers that lead into the South's heartland, allowing for transit of supplies to the soldiers stationed in these vast expanses. With a much smaller army and the entirety of the Western theater to defend, Confederate forces are stretched thin, leaving them vulnerable to Union attack. In March 1864, President Lincoln places newly promoted Lieutenant General Grant at the head of the entire Union army. In turn, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman is put in charge of the Department of the Mississippi on March 18th. The Western Theater now rests on the shoulders of a mercurial major general with a mixed record, bouts of depression, and the tragedy of a son's death. Sherman's opponent in the Confederacy, General Joseph E. Johnston, comes to the Western Theater well ravaged by the rigors of the battlefield and tired of the war, as revealed after he was wounded by a shell. I possessed in no degree the confidence of this government, and now a man who does enjoy it will succeed me and be able to accomplish what I never could. But the Civil War and the Confederacy will never let go of General Johnston. General John Bell Hood will run into battle on horseback and not let the absence of a leg stop him from leading his men. When Hood returned to action in the Battle of Chickamauga in Georgia in the Western Theater on September 20th, after his arm was rendered useless by a shell, fate would prove his return to fighting short-lived. His right leg was severely wounded by a miniball and amputated. Things looked grave for General Hood, but he recovered to once more ride a horse by the following January. Where Johnston was already tired and disenchanted, Hood is determined and anxious to get back on the front lines. But what of the troops commanded by these generals? What have the rigors of war done to these men? Most are white, aged 18 to 30 and many are Protestant. 
They stand, on average, at five foot eight and weigh in around 143 pounds. While a majority are American-born, some Irish, English, Hispanic, French, Italian, and German immigrants serve in both armies. One quarter of the Union Army are foreigners. African-American soldiers also fight in the Union Army, about 210,000. In 1862, the Confederacy started a draft that required men to serve, while the Union followed the next year. Soldiers of both sides could hire a non-draftee to take their place on the battlefield. At this moment, in March 1864, the players are about to come together in a bloody campaign, one upon which the fate of the war rests. Sherman stands ready with an army 80,000 strong, while Johnston's is half that size. The Union prepares from their base at Chattanooga, while Johnston and his men are at Dalton, setting up what fortifications and defenses they can amongst the ridges and valleys. Further east is Sherman's goal, the city of Atlanta. Atlanta is key to the Confederacy. The hub of the South, it is the main distribution point for the Confederacy, with a railroad that extends to the Midwest and is vital in bringing supplies to the soldiers. If the Union takes Atlanta, they will get possession of even more of the Western theater. Nine states total will be under their thumb, and the Civil War will be tipped in favor of the North. General Johnston, after the Union's wheels begin turning, recognizes the importance of Atlanta. The importance to the Confederacy of defeating the enterprise against Atlanta was not to be measured by military consequences alone. Political considerations were also involved and added much to the interest of that campaign. Back in Washington, D.C., President Abraham Lincoln is nervous. No president since Andrew Jackson has served a second term since 1832, and none of them were faced with a civil war that proved longer lasting than initially anticipated. Many blame Lincoln for the Union's failure to end the war in a more timely manner. If there is not a major victory for the North before re-election, a candidate pushing for peace, perhaps on a pro-slavery platform, is bound to win the presidency. As Grant prepares to take the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, Sherman must take the nerve center of Atlanta and also spread the Confederacy's forces thin. May 1st is the date set to begin Union machinations towards Atlanta. On that day, Sherman stands with his three armies, Major General James B. McPherson's Army of the Tennessee, Major General John M. Schofield's Army of the Ohio, and Major General George H. Thomas's Army of the Cumberland. They total 100,000 strong and are faced with a dire mission. First Lieutenant Ralsa C. Rice, who would be promoted on May 3rd, is part of Company B of the 125th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Bragg had been superseded by General Joe Johnston, known to be one of the ablest generals in the Confederate Army. Every effort had been made to create an army able to cope with Sherman. From the most reliable sources, the rebel army which now confronted us numbered 75,000 men posted behind strong works or on such naturally defensive positions that fully made up any discrepancy in numbers. When Greek meets Greek, then comes the tug of war. It starts with a skirmish on May 1st at Old Stone Church outside of Reno. Another occurs at Lee's Crossroads, right near Tunnel Hill and Ringgold Gap the next day. It is followed by skirmishes at both Catoosa Springs and Red Clay on 
May 3rd. May 4th marks the major start of the Atlanta campaign as Union troops stealthily move into position. General Thomas of the Federal's Army of the Cumberland moves his men along Ringgold's Western and Atlantic Railroad. On May 9th, General McPherson's Union Army of the Tennessee runs into such strong Confederate resistance near Risaka that one fierce battle later results in a Union retreat east towards the small town. McPherson moves his soldiers back three miles to Snake Creek Gap and feels Risaka itself is too strong for a military surprise. In retrospect, Sherman is positive McPherson's army could have handled the town's small brigade and issued a critical blow to Johnston's army. But General Sherman's further plan is to disrupt the railroad and telegraph lines south of Dalton and impede the flow of communication and resources further down the line. The hope is to force Johnston to evacuate his headquarters in the town of Dalton. If Johnston does elect to send a detachment of men, however, they will be forced to fight on ground advantageous to the Union. Either way, Johnston's army will be depleted. On the evening of May 11th, Sherman learns of Johnston's evacuation of Dalton and moves towards Rasaka. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.